Good evening, and welcome to the American University Museum and a conversation with Amber Robles Gordon about her stunning and provocative exhibition. We are so excited to have Amber's installation suspended here in our museum. It is beautiful, and it has arrived at a critical time. Successions features genre-bending abstractions recalling Robles Gordon's Afro-Caribbean heritage and her experience as a part and not a part of these United States. Her work hangs here in opposition to the status quo. If you haven't yet experienced her work in person, we are open to the public and free Fridays through Sundays, 11 to 4 p.m. Speaking with Amber Robles Gordon today is Daniel Immervar, Associate Professor of History at Northwestern University, where he teaches global history and U.S. foreign relations. His book, How to Hide an Empire, I love that title, <laughs> How to Hide an Empire, is a retelling of U.S. history with the overseas parts of the country included in the story. It was a national bestseller and won the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations Farrell Prize. Immervar is currently working on two research projects, one on the pop culture of U.S. global hegemony, the other a book about 19th century urban catastrophes. Immervar's writings have appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, The Guardian, Slate, The Nation, and The New Republic. Amber Robles Gordon is a mixed media visual artist of Puerto Rican and West Indian heritage. She is known for her commissioned and temporary and permanent public art installations for numerous government agencies, institutions, universities, galleries, and art fairs. Robles Gordon has over 20 years of experience exhibiting and in art education, commission critiques, lectures, teaching, and exhibition coordination. She received an MA in painting from Howard University here in Washington, D.C., and is exhibited nationally and internationally. Her artwork has been reviewed and featured in numerous magazines, journals, newspapers, and online publications, and we are so happy to have her with us. Uh, most recently, she held an online solo exhibition at Galeria de Arte Universidad del Sagrado Corazón, San Juan, Puerto Rico and was featured by Taffeta Gallery in the 154 Contemporary African Art Fair in London, England, and during London Art Week. In 2022, she's presenting a traveling exhibition in collaboration with Cultural DC and El Cuadrado Gris Galeria in Puerto Rico. Amber and Daniel's talk will likely illuminate the historical underpinnings of US colonialism, Americanism, institutional racism, anti-blackness, and their immeasurable impact in the U.S. territories. We hope you enjoy the conversation and will join in by click clicking on the chat bubble at the bottom of your screen or uh, raising your hand and contribute your questions and comments. We'd love for you to participate. We want a conversation. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to Amber and Daniel. Uh, great. I'm so excited to be here. Um, just procedurally, the way we'll do this is Amber and I will speak uh, for about 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up to a larger conversation with the audience. So there are two modes of audience participation. One is um, putting questions in the chat, and the other is raising a hand. If you're raising your hand and we're talking for 40 minutes and we haven't gotten to you, don't worry. 40 minutes is just me and Amber or so, uh, 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have a, a, a larger conversation and we're looking forward to it. Um, I want to just say how excited I am to be having this conversation um, because I am a historian of U.S. empire in its various forms, and I'm particularly interested in, in, the, in the United States' territorial empire. Um, often when people think about the United States, they think about it the way it describes itself as a union of states. And you can imagine that that's all the country is. But in fact, from the first day, it received freedom from Great Britain uh, to today. And every day in between, it's been something more than that. It's been a union of, or not even a union, a collection of states and territories. And that and territories part has a way of slipping, uh, I think, from the public mind. And um, it's really exciting to see Amber bring that back. So what Amber's work does 
is um, does something I actually never seen an artist do before, uh, which is not just inter- uh, engage with the experience of inhabitants of one of the U.S. territories, uh, but but to try to, in some ways, encompass them all. So there are five inhabited overseas territories that the United States has, uh, Puerto Rico, Guam, the U.S. Virgin Islands, American Samoa, uh, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. Uh, and the United States also has this, its capital is this weird non-state territory, at the Washington, D.C., where the license plates say, end taxation without representation. Uh, and if you add up everyone who is living um, in the uh, U.S. overseas territories, we're talking about 3.5 or so million people. And if we add the residents of D.C. to them, we are talking about over 4 million people. And, you know, I, I feel like those are uh, that's 4 million people who don't always get a hearing uh, nationally. Wow. And, and there's a lot of ways in which that happens in news coverage and um, uh, federal funding and all that kind of thing. But but that might also be true artistically. And, and one thing that's really exciting to me about this work is that it, it seeks to do that. It seeks to put those spaces, the subordinated spaces of the United States front and center. So Amber, how did we get here? I have, you sent me, I'm very glad you did, uh, mm-hmm. your MFA thesis uh, from Howard uh, in 2010. And it was not about Overseas empire. It was not about U.S. territories, and you've gone on a kind no. of journey. And so, tell us about that. How did you get to this point? Yeah. So, just real quick, my thesis is about uh, how to use art or creation in general as a as a kind of modality for healing, and it's a, an ongoing healing. Um, and I'm going to link this because I, I actually think it's not specifically related, but it's related because I believe that healing is an ongoing practice. Um, and therefore, I believe that my art practice is an ongoing form of healing. Um, and when I started this journey, it was absolutely to heal my five-year-old self. I um, live, I was raised in uh, Arlington, Virginia, and my family's from um, Port- between Puerto Rico and St. Thomas. And my first language was Spanish in a pro- probably about around five. Uh, So that's, I think that's kindergarten. I was teased immensely. um, And it was something that I I couldn't figure a way out of. So I literally came home one day and decided to tell my my Latina mom, my Afro-Latina mom, um, that I didn't want to speak Spanish anymore. Uh, And I guess, you know, you don't realize it then, of course, because I was too young, but it was a relinquishing of, of a portion, not only the language, my first language, but it was also part of my, my heritage and culture. Um, so later on, I decided before my goal originally was to do this before 30, and that didn't happen. <laughs> but um, in 2017, I decided to reach out to people that I knew in Puerto Rico. Uh, there was a uh, writer that had written about my work before and a couple uh, applied to a couple of residencies, but it was in a really weird time for uh, PR. And so the residencies didn't come through. In fact, some of them were not even um, active at that point, what I eventually found out. But um, I got a message eventually from uh, Sagara de Corazon, which um, Jack mentioned earlier, and uh, I was given a solo exhibition. It was it was a great feeling because I literally, you know, I felt like I, I I'd manifested it, you know, um, because I needed to make a space to be able to create, live, uh, and make experiences in, in my place of birth. So I looked at this as a part of my healing, a part of an extension of my art practice. Now, what happened is um, that kind of evolved into um, a greater conversation or or acknowledgement uh, um, about the territories. Um, So it was not only that I eventually figured out that... PR, Puerto Ricans were being treated unfairly, but it was then an extension of, wait a minute, you've lived in DC and you have felt that, you know, um, depending on the political stance and who's in, who's in uh, office, that people of color um, and uh, other, and I say people of color, I mean the array of people that are non-Caucasian, uh, non-European, um, are not treated in the same way and our, our, our vote is not treated in the same way. Um, and so that's what made me hone in on the territories uh, and, and 
the two different bodies of works. Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting. What I hear you saying is that on the one hand, this is a highly personal body of work, but I also know that it is a research body of work that, that part of it involves not just recuperating your own experience in the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, but also reaching out and reaching, in fact, quite far out into the Pacific, um, to Guam, to the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, to American Samoa. And I'm wondering, maybe you can tell us a bit about that research part. What, what did you learn or what did that research look like and how did that affect how you saw yourself as someone who's living in D.C. and, uh, and you know, come from the U.S. Virgin Islands and, and Puerto Rico? Um. I don't know. I, I, it's kind of interesting, and this is not in not a um, commentary about the book. But the when I started to research about um, the territory, some of it was just very daunting. Um, when you when you start to hear about the fact that the expansion of the empire began <laughs> because farming was not going well in the U.S., um, was very that, that part was I could deal with. Um, um, what was good that's when they started to go uh, to get the, the guano islands, if I'm not mistaken, the guano from the islands. Um, and which is a common, it's basically bird dew um, that builds up over time. And it's very, what is it? Um, it's, uh, is it the iron? It's iron or is it zinc? So nitrate. So the, nitrate. so the, the first U S overseas expansion is a, yeah. a series dozens of quote unquote guano islands that mm-hmm. uninhabited islands that the United States claims because mm-hmm. of the nitrate rich, um, bird droppings on them. That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so once you start to research that, uh, and, and what I thought was fascinating is, is it's not only that they wanted the islands, they later on realized that it's, that it's also the, uh, what's beneath the water, the, the expansion of the water and the, the air itself to a certain extent, when it comes to being able to use it as a, as a, um, portal into other parts of the world where they thought that they might have to go into combat at some period of time. Um, It was amazing to hear some of the the instances of what the U.S. will do um, and has done in order to gain leverage, in in order to gain um, more power. Um, And some of it was shocking. Like, for example, I couldn't, (laughs) when I, there were parts of the book where I had to put down the information because I couldn't take what was going on to people. Like, for example, what happened with Vietnam um, and the amount of torture that not only from um, uh, the Japanese, but also throughout when um, the U.S. finally came in. Uh, It was, it was just a lot for my spirit, if that makes any sense. When you, so when you think about this task that you set yourself, which is visually representing or capturing in some way the spirit of or the experience of of colonization, colonization by the United States. Are there visual traditions to draw on? I mean, one thing that is so exciting to me about your work is that there's there's no obvious precedent that I know of for it. There's no artist who's I, I, I'm, you know, I'm sure I, I, I might have missed something, but I I didn't know of a whole kind of school of art that was trying to think about territorial colonialism within the United States and trying to sort of get at all the many facets of experience. So when you're, when you were thinking about what this would look like, how you would represent your experience and the experience of others, what, what were you thinking visually? Okay. Um, Chelsea, can you please go to the uh, slides and start? This is a, I'm just going to go through a couple and then I'm going to go back and, and isolate some features of some of the works. So the work is divided into two different uh, bodies of works. The first one is Place of Breath and Birth, which is the one where I, it's a smaller works, so they're 18 by 24, they're collages, and it's where I specifically talk about my interpretation of uh, being in Puerto Rico and staying there for a certain amount of time, back, traveling back and forth, um, and my observations about the territory and my own personal heritage heritage and relationship to the territory. Now, um, the larger, the quilts, they are 104 by 90, 90 something, um, I believe 92. They are double-sided quilts. And actually they began as one-sided. Can you go to the the image that um, focuses on, in on my studio? It's two of the quilts side by side. All right, so once I got finished with the, um, 
Okay, that's not gonna work. Go to the political one, back to DC public political. Thank you. Okay, so to kind of deconstruct um, each visually each territory or, or represent the territories kind of in criticism, I decided to deconstruct either their seal or their flag. Um, and when I <laughs> and it, the only one that did not. There was only one that I felt actually represented, um, whether it be culturally or spiritually, the actual territory was American Samoa. Amer the Americans, and I'm pretty sure that that one was actually created by an American Samoan. Samoan. <laughs> and um, the rest, what I felt was through the research was that they were U.S. like um, American images imposed onto uh, individual people and cultures, but they did not necessarily, in my opinion, represent um, fully the territory. So in the political side, which was at first only what I was going to do, uh, I, I literally tear apart. I go through their um, the seal or the, the flag. And in that process, once I completed the first two, which was this one, uh, this is uh, DC political, and this side of it is uh, welcome to the district of colonialism. Um, I began to realize that I didn't want to only be uh, represent a sense of criticism or a sense of kind of uh, critique and dissecting of the US impact on the territory. I decided that I needed to make, I need to also represent the cultural, the spiritual. I needed to make them three-dimensional. I needed you to be able to walk around them. And I needed you to have to confront, um, to confront them with your physical presence and its physical presence. Uh, so then I made them double-sided. If we can go to the next, and this is a DC spiritual, which is is the literally the the other side of the, the DC political, and this represents the Native Amer the three Native American tribes that are um, indigenous to the District of Columbia. So one of the things I will say, um, what was really important to me as I began to research what was going to be on the spiritual sides, uh, I started initially with going in and investigating, you know, uh, very specific symbology and and what that was going to mean and how I was going to present it. Um, and it might have been purpose like the, the universe that the first one was def definitely representing um, indigenous Native American indigenous tribes. But as I did that, it just didn't register to me that I should um, take on specific symbols because um, I, I don't want to stomp on anybody's spiritual or cultural um, heritage. Um, and that's when I decided that I was going to work in, uh, in abstraction uh, to, to shy away from figuration and work in abstraction because I'm drawn to, of course, abstraction, I'm drawn to sacred geometry. Uh, and, you know, and I believe that it can be accessed universally, period. Um, and I want this work to be accessed universally. If, if anything, I want it to be uh, something that anybody can come to and say, this is something that speaks about humanity, not about specifically a, um, a territory and their specific symbology. Um, yeah, we, is that? Yeah, that's very helpful. And I just wondered if we can pause on the, the way you've set this up. So not just, sort of abstract, abstract forms of representation you've chosen, but to represent each of these spaces, each of these colonized spaces, politically and then spiritually, and having those as sort of separate. Um, I mean, in some ways, it's, it's really evocative, nicely evocative, because there's a way in which colonialism operates as a form of political subordination, right? People right. don't have same voting rights and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but then there's also a way in which it operates as a sort of spiritual subordination. And, you know, your story of, you know, feeling cut off from a birth language mm -hmm. is exactly the kind of thing that a lot of colonized people often speak about when they talk about that other side, the spiritual side of, of being colonized and, and how hard that can be. And so, uh, you know, I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about the differences representationally, either in this DC one or in any of them between political and spiritual? How are you thinking about that difference? Um, huh. 
beyond beyond the point that it was just really essential because in the criticism of, in in how I depicted the political side, I just couldn't let that be the only way that, that I re represented the territories because in in some sense that's how the any empire looks at an entity that they're overseeing. They see it, seeing it for their own political gain and they, they dampen, they stomp on, they dehumanize uh, in some shape or form uh, the actual people that they're representing or, or, or overseeing. So I didn't want to replicate that. I had to make the, the spiritual and cultural side as important. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how else to explain that. Can, um, can I ask about the, the format of these uh, or the um, why quilts? Um, I, <laughs> I know that there's, there are a lot of traditions of quilting and I know that um, in Hawaii, which, you know, is now a U.S. state, but is, um, had also been a, a U.S. territory or, or colony. Uh, there'd been a tradition of people sort of playing with the, um, playing with the images of sovereignty and playing with, you know, mm -hmm. the possibilities of sovereignty through quilting. Um, I, I know that actually because Alvita Akibo, who's a um, historian at Yale is, and I think on this call, uh, had, you know, has written about that. Um, but you, you chose the quilt and what, what about quilting sort of worked for you in, 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 uh, in this project? So I have a long history, like personal history with quilts. Um, and quilts and fabric. I uh, even to the point where at one point I, I wanted to be a fabric design. I mean, a clothing designer. Um, so I've always honed into our relationship with uh, the human relationship with fabric. Uh, ultimately, I, I've even considered it to be our, our you know our second skin. We we literally don't leave home without it, without some sort of um, covering, um, and it becomes part of our persona. Uh, and then there's the, there's the innovation side of it. I've always been intrigued by taking objects and things that we have discarded and uh, cr literally creating with them. That, that part of the in art industry is, is what's um, exciting to me. It's at least part of it is that's what ex it excites me. Um, but also my mother exposed me to an extensive um, array of uh, quilts and fabric art throughout my life, whether it be um, Ecuadorian and Salvadorian, they, they have these um, not felt, but they're cloth quilts and they're like scene quilts. They, they have uh, that come this succinct, like one, two, three. Um, and um, African-American quilts, the G's Ben's Gies Ben's quilters, um, a Barbara Cole. Uh, it, fabric is always, fabric as art has always been a part of my uh, life. Um, and therefore it just made sense to me. And the other thing is, that, like I said before, I, I, I needed people to have to confront the work. Um, I, and because they're so, they're so large and because, you know, I specifically hung them from the ceiling in that space, uh, so that you would have to walk up to them and I don't know, just, just confront them. Yeah. And it's interesting what that, I'm trying to say. It's interesting that you really, one of the facts you use about quilts is the double-sided possibilities of them, right? I mean, there's a, there's a way to do a quilt where it's just, there's the display side and then there's the reverse and, and that's not what you've chosen to do. Um, what, what surprised you as you were kind of, putting together this project and, and, and sensing out all the visual possibilities? I think one of the things in relationship to actual technique, it surprised me is um, how hard it is to uh, draw on fabric. <laughs> and I know it's like a simple thing, but when you're creating massive things like this, it, it, you, I, I literally, it, it's a teaching um, a teaching process. I mean, that's one of the things I love about and, and why I switch mediums depending on what I'm trying to say and convey or end with the project. Uh, but it was a serious task, um, especially with fine lines. Um, then in relationship to the research, I, I was surprised by the amount of cruelty that happens uh, when it comes to making two people of color and or people that are considered uh, to be poor um, in order for 
progression to happen. We, we have, we have this society and not just American society, but society in general has made it too easy to sacrifice lives for what they consider a greater cause. Um, and usually that greater cause has to do with, um, with either uplifting or making it easier for people that have money to continue to do what they do. And that saddens the hell out of me. Um, That might not have been what you were. (laughs) Oh, that's very interesting. I noticed that one, one thing you said about what, what these quilt and what this art in general might do is, is confront people, right. Force them to see, or, you know, placing it in a way that you you have to kind of walk up to it or it kind of gets in your face. Do you feel like the audience here, I mean, who, who's the audience here? Is the audience people who've mm. been sort of, you know, affected by colonialism and, and see their stories told here? Is the audience, you know, the perpetrators, people sort of the blithe recipients of, of whatever dubious benefits there are of empire who, you know, just have, don't really think about it at all. And, and you're confronting them with, with a, you know, a sort of hidden truth. How, how are you thinking about that? don't know that I thought of who was going to be the audience. Um, not in that way. I just knew that I had to, that it wasn't just about myself, especially be, after completing the first four works, four works of the Place of Breath and Birth series. Um, I, but, I, but I tend to do that with my work, period. I, I tend to have like a, um, the whole micro macro where I'm working on something specifically for myself um, it, when it comes to something in, in this point in my life that I need to work through and or then I connect it with something that is that it impacts social um, the social aspect of others period um, I, I just see them as something that you have to they're they're interchangeable I I, I don't hmm. I kind of don't even know how to answer that question. Yes, but on the other hand, do I want people to come up to it and see, okay, um, wow, you know, I didn't even consider these 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 other territories as part of the U.S. at all? Absolutely. I, I, I absolutely want to open up um, the floor, continue and continue this conversation because there are a lot of people that don't know that Guam and or... Uh, um, Northern Mariana Islands are a part of the U.S. You know, when I was looking at that map that you um, placed in your book, it, it's just amazing because I, I even don't remember that in my my own education. Um, and that's sad. Um, yeah, no, I, um, I, 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 sh- I share the feeling. I remember, um, you know, getting educated up to, college and grad school and and having only the dimmest of awarenesses of the literal literally you're just where the borders of the United States are and were yeah. um, so we talked a little bit about abstraction but it's nice that we're paused on this uh, collage <laughs> because the work isn't entirely abstract and uh, two images that pop out one on this and one on uh, the collage of yourself is, as the Virgin Mary is, uh, are the flag, and then you, and I, I'm curious what, what those and 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 in both instances the title draws our attention to that object that pops out. Uh, so could you talk about about this image we've, we're looking at right now? The sure. you talk about the place of the flag. The the title uh, and my flag flies higher than yours. Um, tell us about that. So this is specifically about how um, the kind of story that comes to mind with this particular work is when in 20, I think it was 2017, when Trump um, was literally threw paper towels at, at Puerto Ricans um, and was upset with them for uh, affecting the their need to have resources um, because of the hurricanes affected his bottom line when it came to his budget. Um, And there there was, there was, I remember watching how um, the news and media was representing either PR or St. Thomas. And I remember being angry about it and disheartened 
Um, and this was one of my reactions to that. However, it's also, so for example, the flag on the right, you see the Puerto Rican flag, and then it's, it's hard to see in this image, but the broken, there's a broken up flag on the, on the bottom left. Um, and that is the U S flag. So it, uh -huh. it's in contrast, it, it's, it's basically challenging, um, the U S in some ways to say that, are you meeting up to your own flag? Are you meeting up to your own, um, height? to some extent. But then also, um, and you can't see it in this image, but uh, where the water is, where the blue rim is water in, inside of the circular form. And then on the outside, I, I dissect uh, some of the iconography that is uh, kind of portrayed in some of the things, the postcards and or um, well, postcards that are you can buy in Puerto Rico. And one of the things I noticed was that in these postcards, it highlights people of a lighter of a lighter skin. It's very, very infrequent that you have people that are not that are brown skinned or darker toned Afro Latinas uh, that are in the media. In, in, in the public domain and, and are, are used as a representative of the entire, um, or at least even a great portion of Puerto Rico. So I, I look at it as, as kind of a back and forth. I, I am not just supporting PR and, and or um, there are other instances in other works that I am challenging both the territory and US, but that is absolutely one of the ways that I'm challenging it in, in this work. Yeah. I was struck by this, um, just by the concept of the sort of flag height as a expression of something. Um, you know, there's a long history of the United States, particularly in its territorial empire, playing all kinds of flag games and yeah. you know, having rules about how high, who can, oh, yes. what flags can be displayed, how high yeah. they can be displayed. Do they have to come under the stars and stripes or can they be displayed at the same height? And, and you know, and, and all of those are ways, are symbolic ways of asking the deepest question, the question of sovereignty, the question of who ultimately is in charge here. So Girl. I thought that was a really... Exactly. Kind of interesting way to get at that. Um, I'm wondering, um, Chelsea, if we could go back uh, a few slides to the uh, the sort of Virgin Mary collage. Mm. This one, yes. And you know, you do something brave here, which is that you just put yourself right smack in the middle of it. And you know, can you tell? Can we talk about sure. that. So this is something that I, I think it's one of those internal questions that I have because um, it happens to me often. Like, for example, one of the, um, in the tours that I've been giving at, at uh, AU, one of the examples I give is when I went to the American Academy of Rome um, and inside of that space, inside of the studio space that they give you uh, where I literally had to be for an extended period of time, like it, it was so much whiteness. Um, and I think I've always had this really, uh, really beautiful connection, a concrete connection with color. And so when I'm in situations where it, it, that are devoid of color um, and or some form of representation of who I am, I, it, there's, a, there's a, almost like a trigger that happens to me um, where I start to question, you know, is this a true reflection of what it is that built up and is a part of whatever history that is represents this space? Um, or is it a cover? And if so, I want to know more. I want to know why. Um, and so for, for me, this is just one of my responses to, to, being, to seeing so many of the Virgin Marys. Um, and, and it's not just the Virgin Mary. It's also the depiction in which women are held up in light, which women are held up in, in media, which women are um, used to represent a body of group of people. Um, and this is how I convey that in this particular artwork. Um, mm -hmm. You can't see it in here, but I also, uh, the top red layer, those are um, representation uh, below the red is a representation of the Taino uh, Indians. Um, and it's almost like uh, my ancestors are, are, are behind me to some extent. Um, yeah. But uh, then below that, there are other aspects that are specifically pulled from the uh, uh, the botanica, which is like a, a cultural, uh, it's a pharmacy, it's a, a where you can get healing um, modalities, uh, books, 
about uh, different saints and, and religious practices. But it, it, what I but it, what's important about the Botanica is it's also a community that people tap, kind of come in and come out of when they need it. Um, and it's it's throughout the Caribbean. Or it, I mean, Botanica can, can even be found in, in the U.S. actually. Um, and then on the very bottom, the, the blue layer, they are representations again of, of the Virgin Mary, but also of the caste system that was um, that was once a part of the society. Because And in this work, I'm also questioning, um, and in the Puerto Rico quilt, I'm also bringing, uh, or I'm trying to bring questions about um, Okay, so in the, in the U.S. Census, if you know anything about PR in the U.S. Census, they're, they're the last two, or even the last one, there was a lot of people that, that basically decided to represent themselves as Americans. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, as white versus the Spaniard and or African heritage of that, um, that is absolutely part of the island's heritage. Um, and so I, I, I am I'm trying to trigger that conversation as well about colorism when it comes to specific territories. Yeah. I mean, it strikes me that this is, this collage gets at some of the larger representational questions that are kind of spanned by your work. So represent, reflection of a representation of the self. Okay. We talked about that. And, you know, one can understand there's a long, a long tradition of, of self-portraiture, self-representation of the Virgin mm -hmm. Mary. Mm-hmm. Equally long tradition, you know, all kinds of things to bounce off of. A representation of colonialism. <laughs> that's, I mean, you know, that's harder, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Or at least that's more open. And, um, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, the kind of thing like, how do you paint colonialism or how do you represent colonialism visually? Um, and, and I'm wondering, I mean, I, I realize we have some other people who are going to want to get in, but I'm wondering if you want to just end by reflecting. I mean, that strikes me as a big challenge of, of this whole corpus is, you know, either through individual works or through the work stage collectively, how do you represent colonialism? And, you know, I'm wondering kind of what you came to as an answer to that, to that really difficult question. Um, can we go back to the uh, USVI Chelsea image, the quilt? Thank you. So I do find that that was a hard, hard, definitely a hard thing to do. Um, how do you represent colonialism? Um, but one of the things I did was uh, to look at what was so, I don't know, mind blowing to me is what we hold dear when it comes to groups of people and how, how we um, hold on to sim symbols that can be the duality of the symbology. Um, and, and then what we, what we historically, our social constructs, what we then attach um, the meaning and understanding to these symb symbols, um, you know, and one being the, I think it's a centennial, something like on the plates of, of uh, the license plates of USVI, it, it says the centennial something and, and or, um, oh God, what is it? It's a celebration of something day. Have you heard of that? It's a, uh, Presumably, it's the centennial of annexation, right in 1917. It, it is, but they have a very specific name for it from when they were released, released from the Danish and then uh, under U.S. control. And I can't remember the name of it, but it just blows my mind. Like even tax, taxation without represent, representation, things that we we kind of use as monikers, but they can be seen on both sides of the issue. Um, so that and or how, like, for example, the, the, the bird in this, um, <laughs> in the flag is an eagle. And I, I really question how does that represent the USVI? Yeah. Yeah. How? Um, and then you can't see it in this particular image, but I, I use chains, the, the, the head of the bird and the wing of the bird. They are, are held by chains, gold chains. Um, and that is absolutely a, a representation of, of, of colonialism, at least in my mind, um, and or to some extent uh, materialism. Um, so they were ve they're very subtle ways. Uh, I hope that they are noticeable, you know, but um, but yeah. Okay. 
Um, well, I should not hog all of the questions. Uh, Amber, thank you so much. So I believe that um, Jack will come to the stage. And my understanding is there's two ways to get in on the conversation, uh, raising your hand via the reaction button or shooting us something in the chat. Jack, is that gotten, correct? We've gotten some good uh, questions. People are eager to join in this really wonderful conversation, including me. Um, <laughs> you know, I have the advantage of knowing Amber's work for over 10 years. And what's st striking to me is how uh, coherent that work is over this period of time that from the very beginning, she was experimenting with materials, you know, both <laughs> art and non-art. Uh, and they were also extending into the viewer's space uh, more often than not. And so she's, you know, she did a nice discussion of the materials she uses and the traditions that are behind them. But, you know, the installation itself is really quite wonderful and reinforcing all these themes that you're talking about. Uh, I like to tell people that, you know, Amber first came to me and said she really wanted to paint the floor blue. And of course I put my foot down, but <laughs> one of the all, few times. But, uh, I didn't say paint, but I did ask about putting something on. Yeah, yeah well, okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, so anyway, I, I think the, the, the installation is such a big part of it. And, yeah. and so I encourage people to come down and, and really experience it in the space. Uh, there are many other people who would like to get in here. Uh, there's a question from Claire Evans. I would be interested to hear how people in the territories illustrated in Miss Robles Gordon's work react or respond to her pieces? That's a really interesting question. I don't have an answer for that because I'm not people of the territories. I absolutely would love some feedback and engagement from people of the territories um, because my, my intention is to, is to continue a conversation uh, about the treatment of people in the territories, not, not specifically to, I'm not, I'm not trying to speak for, I'm just trying to speak to everyone. Um, but I would absolutely welcome that. Mm. Yeah, we should figure out how to make that happen. I agree. <laughs> yeah, the, the uh, co colonial tour, you know, I guess. Nice. Uh, there's another uh, question here um, from Laura Roulet. Mm -hmm. Is there a distinction to be made between colonialism and imperialism? Mm. Uh, colony versus territory. And, um, That's a you question, Daniel. Yeah. Um, sure, yeah. Um, so usually when people uh, say imperial, I mean, imperialism can mean a lot of different things. So there can be a sort of classical imperialism of holding colonies, um, but then also more diffuse kinds of imperialism, the ways in which the United States projects its power uh, often come short of annexing territories, but nevertheless seems to have a lot of outsized power and control in, in the world. And, and a lot of people have likened that to empire. Um, colonialism is a much more precise term that refers to a particular kind of empire, i.e. holding places, holding territories as colonies. Um, and so this is a kind of conversation that for me centers around that particular territorial kind of empire. Uh, and, and I'm grateful that it does. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel, the, uh, I see here that Alvita Akibo has her hand up. Uh, uh, how do we get her to enter the conversation? Hello, can y'all hear me? Yes. Uh -huh. Hello. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you so much for this. Um, I've been scrolling through the the different things in the exhibit. I'm hoping I can come see it in person. Um, as Daniel mentioned, I my work is on U.S. territories and iconography and flags in particular. And I definitely see this work um, in the same tradition he mentioned of Native Hawaiian flag quilts um, and the women doing that work. Um, so I my main question was the one that was already asked about reception um, and specifically how people from different colonies are thinking about this work, but I'm wondering if, as you said, you don't know that yet, just in terms of thinking about creating the actual pieces, um, because it seems like, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong and misunderstanding this, but the project overall has an anti-imperial message that it wants to send. And I'm just wondering how you deal with the nuances between each of these colonies and within the colonies themselves, right? Because people are not in agreement about even among people in the colonies are not in agreement about what they think about their relationship to the United States. Um, I'm sure you know there's robust statehood movement in Puerto Rico as well as an independence movement. Um, 
I recently have been in conversations with people from American Samoa who said that they did not appreciate being referred to as a colony at all, and that's not how they see their relationship. So I'm just curious um, how you sort of thought through all of those differences and nuances in your work, even if you haven't had much opportunity yet to see how people have reacted to it. And thank you so much. Yeah, you know, um, it was absolutely part of the um, the research. You know, I, I I absolutely wanted to see both sides of the pendulum, um, but I can't. What I decided uh, ultimately was that I had to I had to push forward um, because the greater conversation was was so important to me, and I also believe. And this is not to minimize any one individual territories and or, and or perspective, but I all, I believe that one of the ways that we stay um, to some extent colonized or conquered um, is because of the, the 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 divisions that have been put in place um, in general to have these conversations. Um, that we don't see the overall goal, which is to figure out how to get out under some of uh, this control. And I'm not at all saying that I know the way to do that. I don't. But I do know that not enough of us are having the conversation with each other. Um, And that's what I want to encourage. That's what I want to speak to. Because Overall, it speaks to the othering that happens when you are non-white. And that happens in our society to so many. You know, and and the term um, people of the greater majority, I've I've always looked at the world and I've always thought, why isn't it that people of color, people that are uh, non-white, why isn't it that more of us are, are having the conversation about being controlled? And or to change the perception of how we think of each other and 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 ourselves. And again, I'm not saying I know I know how. I just know why because it affects everyone of color, and or everyone that that loves a person of color. Um, and I'm, I'm I am of the belief that how, how we treat people is not just about um, ourselves. Uh, it's a representation of humanity. And to me, this is a problem about humanity. And that's how I had to come to it. Um, I hope that answers your question. We have a question here for an academic. Um, Daniel, how does this work and other creative works inform the writing and research process? Uh, so the question is, uh, Amber talked a little bit about how research has informed the creative work. And the question is, yes. how does it go the other way? Yeah, yeah that's a terrific question. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's, ex- I mean, for me, when I I was, I've, I've written a book about uh, these kinds of places. And uh, when you're writing something like that, you look for the distilled subjectivity that someone who's like vividly expressive about what it is to be colonized or what it is to be, you know, living in, you know, this kind of condition, you know, during a war or something like that. And, um, and as a scholar, that's what it takes. I mean, people who can, you know, not just sort of, you know, kind of record their experience, but, but express it and bring you into it. That's what it takes to, to really come up with an under, you know, a kind of, full understanding of, of your subject. So, I mean, as I feel like as a researcher, I am always reliant on people and, you know, sometimes it's artists, sometimes it's writers, sometimes it's journalists, there's all kinds of ways in which it can happen, but I feel like I'm always reliant on people who can sort of represent something as it's happening to them, which is really hard to do. Um, it's actually very hard for us to talk about what we're experiencing to kind of, you know, pull our heads out enough to just get a, some kind of overview. And, um, you know, I think Amber talked about the, the ways in which even within U.S. territorial empire, it can be hard to 
get a conversation going or to see commonalities. And I think one reason, that's one reason I'm so grateful to her for this work that, that tries to sort of give an artistic language uh, to an experience that millions of people, you know, have gone through or are currently going through. Um, and that, you know, for me as a scholar, that just, you know, gives you something to latch onto and, and, and something to start playing with. So, so yeah, no, I find it tremendously exciting. That's a one, wonderful answer. Uh, do you have any uh, questions uh, for each other that you haven't been able to address yet? Hmm. Well, my one question was, um, was what about your own life and or, you know, whether it be social construct or what you came to, what made you decide to um, challenge the, the construction notion of the US? What made you decide to write the book? Yeah, um, so I, there are some books that that have a backstory that's that's like your work and i mean one you know it's a very what i heard you say was this is a personal experience that i learned was a historical experience and and i learned that you know just that moment when i was getting flack for speaking spanish and when i felt that really in a deep way and and you know changed in sort of the course of my linguistic life that's not just a random set of you know, kids being kids, mm -hmm. uh, arbitrarily just choosing to pick on, you know, for something that's instantiated colonialism right there. And like, I get it now. And so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of going from a, from lived experience outward. Um, I have a different kind of backstory. Uh, the, the reason I got into this stuff was, was, was basically living the, the kind of easy experience on the mainland where, one doesn't have to think about Puerto Rico if you live in Pennsylvania. You don't have to think too hard about what's going on uh, in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And, and in fact, I didn't. Uh, and so just, you know, decades just went by and, you know, like, you know, nothing really made it into my head. Uh, and I was teaching U.S. history and I was teaching U.S. history in this, what I now regard to be a kind of blinkered way where the history was just of the, that contiguous blob, the U.S. mainland. And it wasn't until I went to the Philippines, which um, used to be a U.S. territory, in fact, the largest territory the United States has ever held. And I spent some time there. It was for something completely unrelated. I just thought, oh, Christ, this has also been part of the United States. It's visibly obvious. There's no way you could not know that yeah. hanging out in Manila. And, uh, and somehow I realized that the story that I'd been telling myself, the story that I've been telling students was just deeply, profoundly wrong. Um, and, and so, you know, I also had that sort of cut up short moment uh, in a different way where I thought, oh, this is the history of colonialism too. Uh, I, have, I have been swaddled in a kind of um, ignorance <laughs> as a result because that's how empire works. Empire kind of broadcasts some people's experience and, uh, and muffles others. And I realized that I'd been experiencing another side of that, which has been living in this very cosseted world where, you know, I, despite the fact that the United States was my country, despite the fact that I was getting a PhD in U.S. history, uh, that there were huge parts of the United States that I had only, no one had expected me to be able to talk about in any kind of way. Amber, I think this uh, last question is for you. Uh, it's from uh, Napoleon Jones Henderson. <laughs> okay. I hope I... Hope I pronounce this uh, all right. Uh, Ashe, my sister Amber, great pieces, and I hope to see the exhibition in person. However, since the pieces are double-sided, mm -hmm. is the versa a different composition or just the reverse of the side one is viewing? Uh, but also, also, might there be some uh, Du Bois concept of double consciousness? Mm. Hi, Napoleon. Mm. Um, hmm. so, <laughs> so they, we didn't get to talk about how much time do we have? We have a couple minutes. Okay. We didn't get to talk about, um, mediums and, or, uh, like the, the actual structure of the, the works, but for the quilts, I encased all of this conversation in circles. And I do so because one, I, I believe in casting, um, casting spells or prayers. And when you do the research um, uh, about um, that type of work, a practice, they usually do them in, in uh, circles. And so when I, I am trying to project an idea, concept, 
Um, I, I, a lot of times I will do them in circles. And so you have the circle on the, uh, on the political side, um, but that is more representing a target on that side, the target emblem, not target the store, but a target. Um, and then you have on the, on the spiritual side is where I'm looking at prayers, where I'm looking at uh, uh, spells and intentions. Um, and then you have, um, yeah, so, um, but on both sides, I'm absolutely talking about uh, environmental racism. On the political side, can we go to the political? Thank you. Uh, it's an expansion of the conversation uh, and how uh, pressure is depicted, pressure in the body. Can we go to the, the, the slide that talks about the pressure, the gradation um, of, of uh, yes, thank you. So in the studies, uh, the bottom right image is where you are talking about um, uh, it's an image of uh, Hurricane Irma and is how the Doppler system uh, detects and or represents what's going on in a storm. Um, but then above it, you have where pressure points um, like your, your biochemistry and, and how where your energy, uh, the force of your step. And so I was interested in how that's depicted. And, and of course, and I elaborated that in the works. You know, I'm an artist. I love color. So I added layers of color. But um, then um, I was just fascinated at all the different areas of how you talk about pressure, how you talk about energy, um, whether it's through the body, whether it's through weather. Uh, and that absolutely had a point, had a, 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 a influence on how I depicted um, specifically the political side. Can we go back to the political, one of the political images, please? Thing. Not this one. Actually, this is the one where I don't talk about <laughs> weather. Thank you. <laughs> um, but then, yeah, actually spiritual. Can we go to a spiritual image? Thank you. So one of the other aspects that I didn't talk about was how I break down um, the symbology inside of the works when it comes to the line. So it, it, one of the things that I uh, encountered in the um, one of my first trips to PR was the banyan tree. And it's also called the rubber tree. Uh, and it's this beautiful rooted, it has all these multi roots that come from the ground and go up spiral roll up and then they, they branch out. And uh, I was fascinated with this and it's, it's a banyan tree. So it has, it supports ecosystems. Uh, and one of the things that I, I told myself, I promised myself while I was there was to draw daily um, at least two or three sketches. And can we go to one of the sketches images, Chelsea? And the sketches ended up being um, one of the central foundation or, or, or pillars in each work. Um, and at that point, after I'd done one of the uh, a series, a couple of the place of breath and birth, that's when I posed to uh, Jack and my curator, Larry, um, that I wanted to be able to show both works because initially I was only sh going to be showing the, uh, the quilts um, for this exhibit. But that conversation, um, the works were in conversation with each other. Uh, and if they, I'm so grateful that they said, you know, let's do this. Um, so the two sides, I believe, are absolutely different. Um, the intention is absolutely different. The, the, uh, the energy and time that I put into them, um, I, I believe that it's also like casting spells. Um, I had to be, there was a point in this work, especially once the lines, the lines, because each line, uh, when, you, when you teach art, you know, you, you begin, at least I began as an art teacher, I taught the line first and the variations of the line. But the thing about lines is once you start connecting them, they're ultimately going to, to create some sort of uh, visual reference, some sort of iconography. Uh, and so that's when the, the actual, um, uh, images, uh, figuration became, began to came out in, in some of them, at least the first two. Um, and at that point, I really had to almost just entrust what I believe is spirit uh, to move forward because I didn't want there to be figuration. I didn't want there to be an image, um, but there absolutely was in some of them. So I don't, I don't know how else to say that, I, but I, I literally had to trust, um, trust myself, trust my intention, trust the universe 
uh, that I would hopefully represent um, through my work what the intention was uh, in a in a as graceful way as I possibly could. Amber, thank you for casting your spells in the museum <laughs> and and over this audience. Uh, Daniel Imrevar, thank you so much. Uh, for, yes, thank for you, Daniel. Contribution to this thank conversation, you, Chelsea. Thank you, thank you, audience, for coming. And uh, please, I can't tell you enough how you need to come down and see the work in person. Uh, it'll be up through December 12th. And we're open to the public Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays from 11 to 4 without an appointment. So come on by. Free parking on the weekends, too. And you can contact us for a tour of the exhibition, too. That's right. That's right. By appointment. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>